The Old Timer Steeplechase by Andrew Barton Patterson. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. The sheep was shorn, and the wool went down at the time of our local racing, and I'd earned a spell. I was burnt and brown, so I rolled my swag for a trip to town, and a look at the steeple chasing. Twas rough and ready, an uncleared course, as rough as the blacks had found it, with barbed wire fences topped with gorse, and a water jump that would drown a horse, and a steeple three times rounded. There was never a fence the tracks to guard, some straggling posts to find em, and the day was hot and the drinking hard, till none of the stewards could see a yard before nor yet behind em. But the bell was rung and the nags were out, excepting an old outsider, his trainer started an awful rout, for his boy had gone on the drinking bout, and left him without a rider. "'Is there not one man in the crowd?' he cried. "'In the whole of the crowd so clever, is there not one man that will take a ride on the old white horse from the northern side that was bred on the Mookie River? It was an old white horse that they called the Cow.' and a cow would look well beside him. But I was pluckier then than now, and I wanted excitement anyhow, so at last I agreed to ride him. And the trainer said, Well, he's dreadful slow, and he hasn't a chance whatever, but I'm stony broke, so it's time to show a trick or two that the trainers know who train by the Mooki River. The first time round at the further side, with the trees and the scrub about you, just pull behind them and run out wide, and then dodge into the scrub and hide, and let them go round without you. At the third time round, for the final spin, with the pace and the dust to blind them, they'll never notice if you chip in for the last half mile. You'll be sure to win, and they'll think you raced behind them. At the water jump you may have to swim, he hasn't a hope to clear it, unless he skims like the swallows skim at full speed over, <laughs> but not for him, you'll never go next or near it. But don't you worry, just plunge across, for he swims like a well-trained setter, then hide away in the scrub and gorse, the rest will be far ahead of course, the further ahead the better. He must rush the jump in the last half round, for fear that he might refuse em. He'll try to balk with you, I'll be bound. Take whip and spurs on the mean old hound, and don't be afraid to use em. At the final round, when the field are slow, and you are quite fresh to meet em, sit down and hustle him all you know with a whip and spurs, and he'll have to go. Remember, you've got to beat em. The flag went down, and we seemed to fly, and we made the timbers shiver of the first big fence as the stand flashed by, and I caught the ring of the trainer's cry, Go on, for the Mookie River! I jammed him in with a well-packed crush, and recklessly, out for slaughter, like a living wave over fence and brush, we swept and swung with a flying rush, until we came to the dreaded water. Ha, ha! I laugh at it now to think of the way I contrived to work it. Shut in amongst them, before you'd wink, he found himself on the water's brink, with never a chance to shirk it. The thought of the horror he felt beguiles the heart of this grizzled rover. He gave a snort you could hear for miles, and a spring would have cleared the channel aisles and carried me safely over. Then we neared the scrub, and I pulled him back in the shade where the gum leaves quiver, and I waited there in the shadows black, while the rest of the horses, round the track, went on like a rushing river. At the second round, as the field swept by, 
I saw that the pace was telling, but on they thundered, and by and by, as they passed the stand, I could hear the cry of the folk in the distance yelling. Then, the last time round, and the hoof beats rang, and I said, Well, it's now or never. And out on the heels of the throng I sprang, and the spurs bit deep, and the whip cord sang as I rode for the Mooky River. We raced for home in a cloud of dust, and the curses rose in chorus. Twas flog and hustle, and to jump you must. And the cow ran well, but to my disgust, there was one got home before us. Twas a big black horse that I had not seen in the part of the race I'd ridden, and his coat was cool and his rider clean, and I thought that perhaps I had not been the only one that had hidden. And the trainer came with a visage blue with rage when the race concluded, said he. I thought you had pulled us through, but the man on the black horse planted too, and nearer to home than you did. Alas, to think that those times so gay have vanished and passed for ever. You don't believe in the yarn, you say. Why, man, t'was a matter of every day when we raced on the Mooky River. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Stable by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug What? You don't like him? Well, maybe. We all have our fancies, of course. Brumby to look at, you reckon? Well, no. He's a thoroughbred horse. Sighed by a son of old Panic. Look at his ears and his head. Lop-eared and Roman-nosed, ain't he? Well, that's how the panics are bred. Gluttonous, ugly and lazy, rough as a tip-cart to ride. Yet if you offered a sovereign apiece for the hairs on his hide, that wouldn't buy him, nor twice that. While I've a pound of the good, this here old stager stays by me, and lives like a thoroughbred should. Hunt him away from his bedding, and sit yourself down by the wall, till you hear how the old fellow saved me from Gilbert O'Malley and Hall. Gilbert and Hall and O'Malley, back in the bush-ranging days, made themselves kings of the district, ruled it in old-fashioned ways, robbing the coach and the escort, stealing our horses at night, calling sometimes at the homestead, and giving the women a fright. Came to the station one morning, and why they did this no one knows. Took a brood mare from the paddock, wanting some fun, I suppose, fastened a bucket beneath her, hung by a strap round her flank, then turned her loose in the timber back of the seven-mile tank. Go? She went mad. She went tearing and screaming with fear through the trees, while the cursed bucket beneath her was banging her flanks and her knees. Bucking and racing and screaming, she ran to the back of the run, killed herself there in a gully. By God, but they paid for their fun. Paid for a deer, for the black boys found tracks, and the bucket and all and I swore that I'd live to get even with Gilbert, O'Malley and Hall. Day after day then I chased them. Of course they had friends on the sly, friends who were willing to sell them to those who were willing to buy. One morning we found them in camp at the Cockatoo Farm. One of us shot at O'Malley and wounded him under the arm. Ran them for miles in the ranges, till Hall with his horse fairly beat, took to the rocks, and we lost him. The others made good their retreat. It was war to the knife then, I tell you, and once 
on the door of my shed, they nailed up a notice that offered a hundred reward for my head. Then we heard they were gone from the district. They stuck up a coach in the west, and I rode by myself in the paddocks, taking a bit of a rest, riding this cold as a youngster, awkward, half-broken and shy. He wheeled round one day on a sudden. I looked, but I couldn't see why. But I soon found out why, for before me the hillside rose up like a wall, and there on the top with their rifles were Gilbert, O'Malley, and Hall. "'Twas a good three-mile run to the homestead, bad going, with plenty of trees. So I gathered the youngster together and gripped at his ribs with my knees. "'Twas a mighty poor chance to escape them. It puts a man's nerve to the test on a half-broken colt to be hunted by the best mounted men in the West. But the half-broken colt was a racehorse. He lay down to work with a will, flashed through the scrub like a clean skin. By heavens, we flew down the hill. Over a twenty-foot gully he swept with the spring of a deer, and they fired as we jumped, but they missed me. A bullet sang close to my ear, and the jump gained us ground, for they shirked it. But I saw, as we raced through the gap, that the rails of the homestead were fastened. I was caught, like a rat in a trap. Fenced with barbed wire was the paddock, barbed wire that would cut like a knife. How was a youngster to clear it that never had jumped in his life? Bang! went a rifle behind me. The colt gave a spring. He was hit. Straight at the slip rails I rode him. I felt him take hold of the bit. Never a foot to the right or the left did he swerve at his stride. Awkward and frightened, but honest. The sort it's a pleasure to ride. Straight at the rails where they'd fastened barbed wire on the top of the post. Rose like a stag and went over, with hardly a scratch at the most. Into the homestead I darted and snatched down my gun from the wall, and I tell you I made em step lively, Gilbert, O'Malley and Hall. Yes, there's the mark of the bullet. He's got it inside of him yet, mixed up somehow with his victuals, but bless you, he don't seem to fret. Gluttonous, ugly and lazy, eats anything he can bite. Now let us shut up the stable and bid the old fellow good night. Nah, we can't breed em, the sort that were bred when we olden's were young. Yes, I was saying, these bush rangers, none of em lived to be hung. Gilbert was shot by the troopers. Hall was betrayed by his friend. Campbell disposed of O'Malley, bringing the lot to an end. But you can talk about riding. I've ridden a lot in the past. Wait till there's rifles behind you. You'll know what it means to go fast. I've steeplechased, raced, and run horses. But I think the most dashing of all was a ride when the old fellow saved me from Gilbert, O'Malley, and Hall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He Giveth His Beloved Sleep by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson The long day passes with its load of sorrow. In slumber deep I lay me down to rest until tomorrow. Thank God for sleep. Thank God for all respite from weary toiling, From cares that creep across our lives like evil shadows, Spoiling God's kindly sleep. We plough and sow, and as the hours grow later we strive to reap, and build our barns and hope to build them greater before we sleep. We toil and strain and strive with one another in hopes to heap some greater share of profit than our brother before we sleep. What will it profit that with tears or laughter our watch we keep? Beyond it all there lies the great hereafter. Thank God for sleep. For at the last, beseeching Christ to save us, we turn with deep, heartfelt thanksgiving unto God, 
who gave us the gift of sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Driver Smith by Andrew Barton Patterson. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Fascio. Twas Driver Smith of Battery A was anxious to see a fight. He thought of the Transvaal all the day. He thought of it all the night. Well, if the battery's left behind, I'll go to the war, says he. I'll go a-driving an ambulance in the ranks of the AMC. I'm fairly sick of these here parades. It's want of a change that kills. A charging the Randwick rifle range and aiming at Surrey Hills. And I think if I go with the ambulance, I'm certain to find a show. For they have to send the medical men wherever the troops can go. Wherever the rifle bullets flash and the maxims raise a din, it's there you'll find the medical men a raking the wounded in, a raking em in like human flies, and a driver smart like me will find some scope for his extra skill in the ranks of the AMC. So Driver Smith, he went to the war a-cracking his driver's whip. From ambulance to collecting base they showed him his regular trip, and he said to the boys that were marching past as he gave his whip a-crack, You'll walk yourselves to the fight, says he. Lord, spare me, I'll drive you back. Now the fight went on in the Transvaal Hills for the half of a day or more, and Driver Smith, he worked his trip, all aboard for the seat of war. He took his load from the stretcher men and hurried them homeward fast, till he heard a sound that he knew full well, a battery rolling past. He heard the clink of the leading chains and the roll of the guns behind. He heard the crack of the driver's whips, and he says to him, Strike me blind, I'll miss me trip with this ambulance, although I don't care to shirk, but I'll take the car off the line today and follow the guns at work. Then up the battery colonel came a-cursing them black in the face. Sit down and shift em, you drivers there, and gallop em into place. So off the battery rolled and swung a-going a merry dance, and holding his own with the leading gun goes Smith with his ambulance. They opened fire on the mountainside, a peppering by and large. When over the hill above their flank the Boers came down at the charge. They rushed the guns with a daring rush, a volleying left and right. And Driver Smith with his ambulance moved up to the edge of the fight. The gunners stuck to their guns like men and fought like the wildcats fight. For a battery man don't leave his gun with ever a hope in sight. But the bullets sang, and the Mausers cracked, and the battery men gave way, till Driver Smith with his ambulance drove into the thick of the fray. He saw the head of the Transvaal troop a-thundering to and fro, a hard old face with a monkey beard, a face that he seemed to know. Now who's that leader? said Driver Smith. I've seen him before today. Why, bless my heart, but it's Kruger's self, and he jumped for him straight away. He collared old Kruger round the waist and hustled him into the van. It wasn't according to stretcher drill for raising a wounded man. But he forced him in and said, All aboard, we're off for a little ride, and you'll have the car to yourself, says he. I'll reckon we're full inside. He wheeled his team on the mountain side and set him a merry pace. A galloping over the rocks and stones, and a lot of the boars gave chase. But Driver Smith had a fairish start, and he said to the boars, Good day. You have Buckley's chance for to catch a man that was trained in Battery A. He drove his team to the hospital and said to the PMO, Beg pardon, sir, but I missed a trip, mistaking the way to go. And Kruger came to the ambulance and asked, Could we spare a bed? So I fetched him here and we'll take him home to show for a bob ahead. So the word went round to the English troops to say they need fight no more, for Driver Smith with his ambulance had ended the blooming war. And in London now, at the music halls, he's starring it every night, and drawing a hundred pounds a week to tell how he won the fight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. There's Another Blessed Horse Fell Down by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Fascio 
When you're lying in your hammock, sleeping soft and sleeping sound, without a care or trouble on your mind, and there's nothing to disturb you but the engines going round, and you're dreaming of the girl you left behind, in the middle of your joys you'll be wakened by a noise, and a clatter on the deck above your crown, and you'll hear the corporal shout as he turns the picket out, there's another blessed horse fell down. You can see him in the morning when you're cleaning out the stall, a leaning on the railings nearly dead. And you reckon by the evening they'll be pretty sure to fall, and you curse them as you tumble into bed. Oh, you'll hear it pretty soon. Pass the word for Denny Moon. There's a horse here throwing handsprings like a clown. And it's shove the others back or he'll cripple half the pack. There's another blessed horse fell down. And when the war is over and the fighting all is done, and you're all at home with medals on your chest, and you've learnt to sleep so soundly that the firing of a gun at your bedside wouldn't rob you of your rest, as you lie in slumber deep, if your wife walks in her sleep, and tumbles down the stairs and breaks her crown, oh, it won't awaken you, for you'll say, it's nothing new, it's another blessed horse fell down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Track by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Fascio Oh, the weary, weary journey on the track, day after day, with the sun above and silent veldt below, and our hearts keep turning homeward to the youngsters far away, and the homestead where the climbing roses grow. Shall we see the flats grow golden with the ripening of the grain? Shall we hear the parrots calling on the bow? Ah, the weary months of marching ere we hear them call again. For we're going on a long job now. In the drowsy days on escort, riding slowly, half asleep, with the endless line of wagons stretching back, while the khaki soldiers travel like a mob of traveling sheep, plodding silent on the never-ending track while the constant snap and sniping of the foe you never see makes you wonder, will your turn come, when and how, as the Mauser ball hums past you like a vicious kind of bee. Oh, we're going on a long job now. When the dash and the excitement and the novelty are dead, and you've seen a load of wounded once or twice, or you've watched your old mate dying with the vultures overhead, well, you wonder if the war is worth the price. And down along Monaro now, they're starting out to shear. I can picture the excitement and the row. But they'll miss me on the Lachlan when they call the roll this year. For we're going on a long job now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Parade by Andrew Barton Patterson, read for LibriVox.org by phone. With never a sound of trumpet, with never a flag displayed, the last of the old campaigners lined up for the last parade. Weary they were, and battered, shoeless, and knocked about. From under their ragged forelocks, their hungry eyes looked out. And they watched as the old commander read out to the cheering men, the nation's thanks and the orders to carry them home again. And the last of the old campaigners, sinewy, lean, and spare, he spoke for his hungry comrades. Have we not done our share? Starving and tired and thirsty, we limped on the blazing plain, and after a long night's picket, he saddled us up again. We froze on the wind-swept copious, when the frost lay snowy white, never a halt in the daytime, never a rest at night. We knew where the rifles rattled from the hillside bare and brown, and over our weary shoulders we felt warm blood run down, as we turned for the stretching gallop, crushed to the earth with weight. But we carried our riders through it, carried them perhaps too late. Steel, we were steel to stand it, we that have lasted through, we that are old campaigners, pitiful, poor, and few. Over the sea you brought us, over the leagues of foam, 
now we have served you fairly will you not take us home home to the hunter river to the flats where the lucerne grows home where the murrumbidgee runs white with the melted snows this is a small thing surely will you not give command that the last of the old campaigners go back to their native land they looked at the grim commander but never a sign he made dismiss and the old campaigners moved off from their last parade end of poem this recording is in the public domain With French to Kimberley by Andrew Barton Patterson, read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Boers were down on Kimberley with siege and Maxim gun. The Boers were down on Kimberley, their numbers ten to one. Faint were the hopes the British had to make the struggle good. Defenceless in an open plain, the Diamond City stood. They built them forts from bags of sand, they fought from roof and wall. They flashed a message to the south help or the town must fall and down her ranks the order ran to march at dawn of day for french was off to kimberley to drive the boers away he made no march along the line he made no front attack upon those meagre fontine heights that drove the scotchmen back but eastward over pathless plains by open veldt and vlay across the front of crunge's force his troopers held their way the springbuck feeding on the flats where mother river runs were startled by his horse's hoofs the rumble of his guns the dutchman's spies that watched his march from every rocky wall were back in haste he marches east he threatens jacob's doll then north he wheeled as wheels the hawk and showed to their dismay that french was off to kimberley to drive the boars away his column was five thousand strong all mounted men and guns there met beneath the worldwide flag the worldwide empire's sons they came to prove to all the earth that kinship conquers space and those who fight the british isles must fight the british race from far new zealand's flax and fern from cold canadian snows from queensland plains where hot as fire the summer sunshine glows and in the front the lancers rode that new south wales had sent with easy stride across the plain their long lean whalers went unknown untried those squadrons were but proudly out they drew beside the english regiments that fought at waterloo from every coast from every clime they met in proud array to go with french to kimberley to drive the boers away he crossed the right and fought his way towards the mother bank the foemen closed behind his march and hung upon the flank the long dry grass was all ablaze and fierce the veldt fire runs he fought them through a wall of flame that blazed around the guns then limbered up and drove at speed though horses fell and died we might not halt for men or beasts on that wild daring ride black with the smoke and parched with thirst we pressed the livelong day our headlong march to kimberley to drive the boars away we reached the drift at fall of night and camped across the ford next day from all the hills around the dutchman's cannons roared a narrow pass between the hills with guns on either side the boldest man might well turn pale before that pass he tried for if the first attack should fail then every hope was gone but french looked once and only once and then he said push on the gunners plied their guns amain the hail of shrapnel flew with rifle fire and lancer charge their squadrons back we threw and through the pass between the hills we swept in furious fray and french was through to kimberley to drive the boers away ay french was through to kimberley and ere the day was done we saw the diamond city stand lit by the evening sun above the town the heliograph hung like an eye of flame around the town the foemen camped they knew not that we came but soon they saw us rank on rank they heard our squadrons tread in panic fear they left their tents in hopeless rout they fled when french rode into kimberley the people cheered amain the women came with tear-stained eyes to touch his bridal rein the starving children lined the streets to raise a feeble cheer the bells rang out a joyous peal to say relief is here ay we that saw that stirring march are proud that we can say we went with french to kimberley to drive the boers away End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Johnny Boar by Andrew Barton Patterson, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Men fight all shapes and sizes as the racing horses run, and no man knows his courage till he stands before a gun. At mixed-up fighting, hand to hand, and calling men about, they reckon Fuzzy Wuzzy is the hottest fighter out. But Fuzzy gives himself away, his style's out of date. He charges like a driven grouse that rushes on his fate. You've nothing in the world to do but pump him full of lead. But when you're fighting Johnny Boar, you have to use your head. He don't believe in front attacks or charging at the run. He fights you from a copy with his little maxim gun. For when the Lord he made the earth, it seems uncommon clear. He gave the job of Africa to some good engineer, who started building fortresses on fashions of his own. Lunettes, redoubts, and counterscarps, all made of rock and stone. The boar needs only bring a gun, for ready to his hand, he finds these heaven-built fortresses, all scattered through the land. And there he sits, and winks his eye, and wheels his gun about, and we must charge across the plain to hunt the beggar out. It ain't a game that grows on us, there's lots of better fun, than charging at old Johnny with his little maxim gun. On rocks a goat could scarcely climb, steep as the walls of Troy. He wheels a 4.7, about as easy as a toy. With bullocks yoked and drag ropes manned, he lifts her up the rocks, and shifts her every now and then, as cunning as a fox. At night you mark her right ahead, you see her clean and clear. Next day at dawn, what ho, she bumps, from somewhere in the rear. Or else the keenest-eyed patrol will miss him with the glass. He's lying hidden in the rocks to let the leaders pass. But when the main guard comes along, he opens up the fun. There's lots of ammunition for the little maxim gun. But after all, the job is sure, although the job is slow. We have to see the business through. The boar has got to go. With Nordenfeld and Liddite shell, it's certain, soon or late, we'll hunt him from his copies, and across the orange state. And then across those open flats, you'll see the beggar run, and we'll be running after with our little maxim gun. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What Have the Cavalry Done? by Andrew Barton Patterson Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jute What have the cavalry done? Cantered and trotted about Rooting the enemy out Causing the beggars to run and we trampled along in the blazing heat over the veldt on our weary feet tramp 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 under the blazing sun with never the sight of a blooming boar cos they'd hunted em long before that's what the cavalry done what have the gunners done battling every day battling any way boers outranged em but what cared they? Shoot and be damned, said the RHA. See, when the fight grows hot, under the rifles or not, always the order runs, fetch up the blooming guns. And you'd see them great gun horses spring to the action front and around they'd swing, find the range with some queer machine at four thousand with fuse fourteen ready fire number one handle the battery neat and quick stick to it too how did they stick never a gunner was seen to run never a gunner would leave his gun not though his mates dropped all around always a gunner would stand his ground take the army the infantry mounted rifles and cavalry twice the numbers i'd give away and i'd fight the lot with the rha for they showed us how a corpse should be run that's what the gunners done end of poem this recording is in the public domain Right in the Front of the Army by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by phone Where have you been this week or more? Haven't you seen about the war? Though perhaps you was at the rear, guarding the wagons. What, us? No fear. 
where have we been why bless my heart where have we been since the bloom and start right in the front of the army battling day and night right in the front of the army teaching em how to fight every separate man you see sapper gunner and c i v every one of them seems to be right in the front of the army most of the troops to the camp had gone when we met with a cowgun toiling on and we said to the boys as they walked her past well thank goodness you're here at last here at last why what d'ye mean ain't we just where we've always been right in the front of the army battling day and night right in the front of the army teaching em how to fight correspondents and vets in force mounted foot and dismounted horse all of them were as a matter of course right in the front of the army old lord roberts will have to mind if ever the enemy gets behind for they'll smash him up with a rear attack because his army has got no back think of the horrors that might befall an army without any rear at all right in the front of the army battling day and night right in the front of the army teaching em how to fight swede attaches and german counts yeomen known as the wet remounts all of them were by their own accounts right in the front of the army End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That VC by Andrew Barton Patterson. Read for LibriVox.org by Aaron Grassy. That VC. "'Twas in the days of front attack, this glorious truth we'd yet to learn it, that every front had got a back, and French was just the man to turn it. A wounded soldier on the ground was lying hid behind a hummock. He proved the good old proverb sound, an army travels on its stomach. He lay as flat as any fish, his nose had worn a little furrow. He only had one frantic wish that, like an ant-bear, he could burrow. The bullets whistled into space. The pom-pom gun kept up its braying. The 4.7 supplied the base. You'd think the devil's band was playing. A valiant comrade, crawling near, observed his most supine behavior, and crept towards him. "'Hey, what cheer, buck up!' said he. "'I've come to save yer. You get up on my shoulders, mate, and if we live beyond the firing, I'll get the V.C. sure as fate, because our blokes is all retiring.' "'It's fifty pounds a year,' says he. "'I'll stand you lots of beer and whiskey. "'No,' says the wounded man, "'not me, I'll not be saved, it's far too risky. "'I'm fairly safe behind this mound. "'I've worn a hole that seems to fit me. "'But if you lift me off the ground, "'it's fifty pounds to one they'll hit me.' "'So back towards the firing line "'our friend crept slowly to the rear o, "'remarking, "'What a selfish swine! "'He might have let me be a hero.' End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fed Up by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by phone I ain't a timid man at all. I'm just as brave as most. I'll take my chance, an open fight, and die beside my post. But riding round the old day long as target for a crop? A drawing fire from poppies? Well, I'm fair fed up. It's wonderful how few get hit. It's luck that pulls us through. Your rifle's fire is no class at all. It misses me and you. But when they sprinkle shells around like water from a cup, from that their blooming pom-pom gun, well, I'm fed up. We never get a chance to charge, to do a thrust and cut, I'll have to chuck the cavalry and join the mounted foot. But after all, what's mounted foot? I saw them the other day. They occupied a copy when the boars had run away. The cavalry went riding on and seen a score of fights. But there they kept the mounted foot. Three solid days and nights. Three solid starving days and nights. It's scarce a bite or sup. Well, after that, a mounted foot, I'm fair fed up. And tramping with the footies ain't as easy as it looks. 
they scarcely ever see a boar except in picture books they do a march of twenty miles that leaves em nearly dead and then they find the blooming boars is twenty miles ahead each footy is as full of fight as any bulldog pup but walking forty miles to fight well i'm fed up so after all i think that when i leave the cavalry i'll either join the ambulance or else the asc they've always tucker in the plate and coffee in the cup but bully beef and biscuits well i'm fair fed up end of poem this recording is in the public domain Jock by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug There's a soldier that's been doing of his share In the fighting up and down and round about He's continually marching here and there And he's fighting, morning in and morning out The boar, you see, he generally runs But sometimes, when he hides behind a rock And we can't make no impression with the guns Oh, then you'll hear the order, send for Jock. Yes, it's Jock, Scotch Jock. He's the fellow that can give or take a knock. For he's hairy and he's hard, and his feet are by the yard, and his face is like the face what's on a clock. But when the bullets fly, you will mostly hear the cry, send for Jock. The cavalry have gun and sword and lance. Before they choose their weapon, why they're dead the mounted foot are hampered in advance by holding of their helmets on their head and when the boar has dug himself a trench and placed his maxim gun behind a rock these mounted heroes pets of johnny french they have to sit and wait and send for jock yes the jocks scotch jocks with their music that'd terrify an ox when the bullets kick the sand you can hear the sharp command. Forty second, that'll double, charge the rocks. And the charge is like a flood when they've warmed the highland blood of the jocks. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Santa Claus by Andrew Barton Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Halt! Who goes there? The sentry's call rose on the midnight air Above the noises of the camp The roll of wheels, the horse's tramp The challenge echoed over all Halt! Who goes there? A quaint old figure clothed in white He bore a staff of pine An ivy wreath was on his head Advance, O oh friend, the sentry said Advance, for this is Christmas night, and give the countersign. No sign, nor countersign have I. Through many lands I roam, the whole world over far and wide, to exiles all at Christmas tide. From those who love them tenderly, I bring a thought of home. From English brook and Scottish burn, from cold Canadian snows, from those far lands ye hold most dear, I bring you all a greeting here, A frond of a New Zealand fern, A bloom of English rose. From faithful wife and loving lass, I bring a wish divine, For Christmas blessings on your head. I wish you well, the sentry said, And here, alas, you may not pass Without the countersign. He vanished, and the sentry's tramp Re-echoed down the line, it was not till the morning light the soldiers knew that in the night old Santa Claus had come to camp without the countersign. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of Rio Grande's Last Race and Other Verses by Andrew Barton Patterson The First Surveyor by Andrew Barton Patterson, read for LibriVox.org by phone. The opening of the railway line, the governor and all, with flags and banners down the street, a banquet and a ball. Hark to him at station now, they're raising cheer on cheer. 
the man who brought the railway through, our friend the engineer. They cheer his pluck and enterprise and engineering skill. Twas my old husband found to pass behind that big red hill. Before the engineer was grown, we settled with our stock. Behind that great big mountain chain, a line of range and rock. A line that kept us starving there in weary weeks of drought, with never a track across the range to let the cattle out. Twas then, with horses starved and weak and scarcely fit to crawl, my husband went to find a way across that rocky wall. He vanished in the wilderness, God knows where he was gone. He hunted till his food gave out, but still he battled on. His horses strayed, twas well they did. They made toward the grass, and down behind that big red hill they found an easy pass. He followed up and blazed the trees to show the safest track, then drew his belt another hole and turned and started back. His horses died, just one pulled through with nothing much to spare. God blessed the beast that brought him home, the old white Arab mare. We drove the cattle through the hills, along the newfound way, and this was our first camping ground, just where I live today. Then others came across the range and built the township here. And then there came the railway line and this young engineer. He drove about with tents and traps, a cook to cook his meals, a bath to wash himself at night, a chain man at his heels. And that was all the pluck and skill for which he's cheered and praised. For after all, he took the track, the same my husband blazed. My poor old husband, dead and gone, with never feast nor cheer. He's buried by the railway line. I wonder, can he hear, when down the very track he marked, and close to where he's laid, the castle trains go roaring down, the one in thirty grade. I wonder, does he hear them pass, and can he see the sight? When through the dark the fast express goes flaming by at night. I think twould come for him to know there's someone left to care. I'll take some things this very night and hold a banquet there. The hard old fare we've often shared together, him and me. Some damper and a bite of beef, a pannikin of tea. We'll do without the bands and flags, the speeches and the fuss. We know who ought to get the cheers, and that's enough for us. What's that? The wish that I'd come down, the oldest settler here. Present me to the governor and that young engineer. Well, just you tell his excellence and put the thing polite. I'm sorry, but I can't come down. I'm dining out tonight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of Rio Grande's Last Race and Other Verses by Andrew Barton Patterson